Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, another maintainer's track session. This time, working group batch. What's new and uh, what's next? My name is Aldo Kuki Condor. I'm a TL at Six Scheduling. Uh, I'm an active member of the working group batch. Hi, everyone. I'm Swati Sagal. I'm a principal software engineer working for Red Hat. And I've been involved in the resource management space for a few years. The focus has been on resource. Uh, uh, focus has been on NumaWare scheduling as well as resource managers, and I'm happy to be here and happy to engage with you guys. Um, so first, first of all, I want to want to start by uh, explaining what a working group is within Kubernetes. Uh, for those of you that not, might not be familiar, hopefully you are familiar with with the six six are groups within special interest groups uh, within Kubernetes as well that uh, have each a responsibility to uh, well, maintain a set of components for the Kubernetes project. Uh, a working group is a bit different in the sense that, for one, it doesn't own any components, uh, and two, it has a temporary nature. Uh, so we get together basically to solve a specific problem, and then we decide, do we, do we dissolve, or maybe we evolve into a SIG. Uh, in this case, uh, I'm here to talk about the working group batch, which as a working group is a forum to uh, discuss enhancements uh, to better support batch workloads. Um, batch might mean different things for different people. So just to be, give some examples, uh, we deal with HPC, AI, ML, data analytics, or even CI CD applications. Things uh, in general, jobs that uh, work to completion. Um, one of the primary goals of the working group is to reduce fragmentation in the ecosystem. If you're already in this room, you might have already seen a lot of talks about batch. Everybody doing different things, and even years before, people are already doing many different things. We want to uh, bring some uh, some cohesion in the in the batch uh, in in the Kubernetes project. Um, and to do this, we gather a set of stakeholders from uh, the community. So SIG, SIG scheduling is uh, one of them. Um, uh, SIG apps, uh, primarily because of the, uh, the job API and the cron job APIs. Uh, SIG node, we still need uh, our resources to run on nodes. Uh, and we have accelerators and whatnot. So we needed them. And auto scaling to obviously scale up your clusters uh, when you need more resources. Uh, but we are not just limited to the Kubernetes uh, developers or uh, maintainers. We uh, welcome uh, a huge diversity of uh, ecosystem developers. Uh, regular attendees to the meetings are uh, folks from uh, Qflow, uh, from Armada, and even from, let's say, competitor schedulers such as Unicorn. Uh, so we, we welcome uh, all the communities to, to come and, and, and bring their ideas. and and feature requests or code. Um, so what's in scope? Um, we're going to go through, through all these topics uh, in, this, in this session. Uh, first, additions to the job API. Uh, the, the Kubernetes project has had the job API for a while, but uh, it needed some, some uh, features, some love. It needed some love. So we, we brought those uh, to the job and cron job. Uh, and then we, we can start talking about job queuing. Uh, maximizing utilization of your clusters. And uh, last, uh, we're also um, discussing topics around uh, specialized hardware, GPUs, TPUs, uh, you name it. So we'll go through all of this, uh, starting with the job API. Um, so let's start with uh, the feature I'm most excited for, because it's the enablement for the rest of the features. Uh, Basically, we reach uh, general availability of uh, job tracking with finalizers in the 126 uh, release. Uh, so the last, the second last. And so what's, what's important about this feature is that before this feature existed, uh, the job controller could actually lose progress uh, of, of the status uh, of the of number of completions, number of failures, etc. And that just happened when you deleted the pods. Um, so that meant that the job controller was actually incompatible with the pod garbage collector, which is ironic because both are uh, Kubernetes components, so they, they didn't really work with each other. So what do we do? We introduce a finalizer. 
uh, to control when pods are uh, deleted. So uh, we use this finalizer to keep the correct tracking uh, of, uh, of pods and make sure they are already tracked in the, in the job status before we delete them. And uh, we have do done some, uh, some testing in, uh, in different uh, environments, and we've, we've observed uh, uh, we can process uh, one jobs of 100,000 pods uh, in minutes, and particularly for index jobs. Um, and this is really not um, a visible feature. Uh, you don't, you don't uh, opt in or opt out. It's, uh, it's by default. Now, uh, starting from uh, when 126 is always on. Uh, and the result that you see is that simply your jobs are tracked correctly. Um, so hopefully, uh, more, more folks, more, more uh, downstream uh, applications uh, or operators can use the job API, uh, trust, trust the job API to handle pod management uh, so that you don't, they don't have to re-implement it. Uh, if you want to learn more about how the feature was specifically implemented, uh, you can refer to the blog post that we wrote for the 126 release. Um, and yeah, it was actually a, a, an interesting journey with uh, some pitfalls and whatnot. So uh, I encourage you to read if uh, you're interested. Um, the next feature I wanted to highlight uh, is um, uh, pod failure policies. So as, as you might know, in a Kubernetes cluster, pods are pretty much ephemeral. They can go down at any point. Uh, and we need some control uh, about uh, what to do when, when there is a failure in a job. Um, and they, the failures can come from so many places, right? Uh, it can come from uh, the scheduler uh, because of preemption. It can come uh, from the API server because of um, uh, the eviction API. Or it could come from uh, different controllers uh, that uh, watch different events and uh, decide to evict a pod. Uh, it can come from the kubelet because the node is reaching, um, it's, uh, it's, it's getting hammered, so the, 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 the node needs to free up some, some resources. It can also evict the pod. And ultimately, you, you might have your own user supply controller. Let's uh, put an example, the descheduler could be one of them uh, that could disrupt your pod, and then suddenly, uh, you, you want to decide, you want to have full control of what to do. Uh, and we had a, a, an API to have some control, right? The, the back of limit, but it's not enough, right? There is only a number you can control. If you put a high number, then too many, uh, you could have too many recreations. If you put a low, low number, you have basically no reliability. Uh, so we introduced this, uh, this API, well, here, we, you, this is a very complex configuration. It could be much simpler. Uh, but uh, you can exactly decide what to do in, in each specific failure. Uh, there are two types of uh, rules or uh, conditions, um, match, matching rules you can use. Uh, one in conditions, for example, this Russian target, or this one com config issue. Uh, or you can react to uh, exit codes. Uh, you can fail. You can ignore. There are a few more options. Uh, and this uh, disruption target condition comes from the kubelet, uh, sorry, from all the Kubernetes controllers, including the kubelet. Um, and this, this one is a sample one. You can actually introduce your own pod conditions, uh, and you can, use, you can rea react to those failures uh, accordingly. Uh, so what's new in 127? Um, we introduced uh, a, a new, uh, we, we introduced some guarantees in the kubelet so that uh, all pods reach a terminal phase so we can reliably uh, apply the, the pod failure policies. But this is still a beta feature, so we are still uh, um, learning. Uh, we're still improving it. Uh, if you want to learn more, uh, Michal here, who is sitting over there, is going to have a presentation on Thursday about um, pod failure policies and some other, some other features uh, the job, of the job API. So if you want to learn more, you can join this session. Uh, the next uh, feature we've worked on is rather simple. simple. Um, so we made completion, the completions field uh, mutable. Uh, just, just that. Uh, it's a validation relaxation. Uh, and there is only one requirement. Uh, the parallelism and number of completions need to match. And that's all. And now, why? 
because well, multiple uh, um, jobs can actually scale up and down. Uh, and so one example of those is PyTorch. So um, we just uh, wanted to accommodate the job API to uh, ex uh, be useful uh, in a wider set of uh, applications. So um, simple, you have a, 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 a configure parallelism and completions, and you just uh, mutate it to, uh, to have a different scale. Um, so what's next uh, in the job API? Um, we are investing in a, a number of, of, of different features. One of them is actually a new sub-project. Uh, it's called Jobset. Uh, Jobset, as its, its name is, implies, it's a set of jobs that uh, work together to, uh, to do one computation. One example is uh, a driver-worker relationship, right? like Spark, for example. You have a driver, and you have the workers, or Ray. So many uh, applications that can use this, this API. The idea is that uh, we have a centralized, uh, let's say, let's call it pod management, but in reality, we are implementing it as a set of index jobs. So a job set is a set of index jobs. Each, each index job is a role. And you can have number of workers or number of replicas for each uh, job. And we also want to automate the pot to pot communication uh, authorization keys if the application requires it, like MPI. Um, so uh, there is that. Uh, as a corollary to uh, get this implemented, we are proposing a, a change in a SIG node uh, in the kubelet to uh, craft environment variables from a file so we can uh, more easily support more uh, APIs. Um, another cap that is kind of still in progress, we, don't, we didn't finish the design yet, is uh, back of limit per index. Uh, naturally, as we released index jobs some years ago already, people have been asking about uh, having control per index. So that's, that's the work we want to do. And that's, this is useful for parallel applications where there are a lot of independent uh, workers working on independent pieces of data. A corollary of this is the ability to retry specific, in, specific indexes instead of re, uh, retrying the entire job. Um, the next uh, idea or work in progress is uh, terminating pods uh, as active. This is a necessary uh, uh, feature for uh, tightly coupled applications that uh, don't actually support more than one uh, worker per index. So we want to accommodate those features too. Um, so a lot of uh, discussions uh, I wanted to, to bring to your attention so you can uh, join the, the meetings or just the GitHub issues and uh, talk about your use cases. Um, we also have some open discussions more, more like abstract or less, uh, less thought, let's say, let's call them. Uh, for example, we've been talking about uh, mutable scaling directives uh, for the jobs when suspended, uh, or we've been talking about uh, terminating pods, uh, terminating pods that are pending. Uh, there is a discussion there. Kevin here is working on that. Um, Demon job is also another proposal that we received recently about the ability to execute a pod per node, uh, but one time, as opposed to demon sets that are you know, continuously running. These are all open discussions. We still, we're still collecting feedback and thinking through the implications. So uh, don't take it, anything as granted, let's say. But uh, we, of course, welcome your, your input. Um, the next one is stateful index jobs to kind of have PVCs per index. Um, the next uh, set of uh, things we're working on are uh, primitives around job queuing and maximizing utilization of, of clusters. And the primary investment here is Q. Um, Q is a, a controller, a Kubernetes native controller that implements job queuing. Uh, it, it offers a resource quota management uh, it, and it has borrowing and uh, preemption semantics so you can maximize the utilization of your cluster. Um, it also supports resource fungibility uh, which means you can, um, you can establish quotas for each uh, kind of resource you have and you know, um, fail over to the next uh, resource uh, if there is not enough capacity. 
for the entire job instead of per pod. Uh, we also we naturally have support for the job API. That's what we've we, we've been working on. So uh, that's the first class citizen. And but we've been adding uh, we added support for Qflow MPI job, and we want to uh, also add more. Uh, that's why we provide we're providing a library so pe so um, implementers can integrate with uh, Q. And we are talking with different communities to uh, do more integrations. Uh, the latest version is 0 0.3, released a couple of weeks ago. And just to give you an overview, um, one of the primary design uh, patterns, uh, primary design of, um, decisions we made with Q is that we don't want to re-implement anything. Uh, we, are, we are fully compatible with Cube Scheduler, with the controller manager and cluster auto scaler, uh, because we take a decision at a different level. Um, basically, uh, Q, here you can see it injected, and uh, it, uh, the only deci decision that Q takes is whether a job should be started or should be suspended as a whole, and then the rest of the operations are handled by the existing components, such as scheduler, to actually assign pods to, uh, to nodes, and the cluster autoscaler to scale up your cluster. Um, did I go? Oh, and next. Uh, the roadmap for 0 0.4, just uh, some improvements to, to some of the features that we already have. Uh, we want to, we have a PR opening the RAID, RAID operator to integrate, uh, and we are working with the Qflow community to um, support more, more uh, APIs. And uh, as I was saying, the, 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 the design principle in Q is that if something doesn't work, in the rest of the ecosystem, in the scheduler or the job controller, we propose uh, we propose uh, fixes or we propose features uh, on those components so that we can uh, implement uh, higher level decisions in queue. And uh, these are a couple of discussions that we are uh, we are uh, having. Um, and if you want to learn more about queue specifically, uh, you can uh, watch our presentation on Tuesday. Uh, for the for the batch and HPC day. Um, next, I'll hand it over to Swati. Hello. Yeah. Okay. So for the next part of the talk, I'm going to be focusing on support for specialized hardware. I'm going to cover what we've been doing as part of topology aware scheduling and uh, start with a brief overview, and then we'll dive into the developments that have happened since we discussed the topic last at KubeCon. So as you see on this slide, we have uh, a Kubernetes cluster with two worker nodes. They look very similar to each other. Um, each node has four instances of device A, four instances of device B, and eight CPUs. So as I said, from scheduler's point of view, both these nodes are completely identical. And, and it seems to appear that resource-wise, they are exactly the same. So if we were to schedule a pod that is requesting both device A and device B, we should end up in a scenario that the pod should succeed. So let's see what happens if we were to place this pod. So if this pod was placed on worker two, the pod succeeds and it goes into running state. But in scenario that the pod ends up on worker one, it ends up in an unexpected behavior and gets rejected. And what we see if we inspect the pod is that it, it has topology affinity error. So let's try to understand why we've, we've run into this unexpected behavior and what exactly is topology affinity error. In order to do that, we're going to zoom into this particular cluster and get a better understanding of how the system has been configured and how those resources have been distributed. So as we see on the top, Topology Manager has been configured with single NUMA node policy, and resources are distributed across NUMA nodes in a way that uh, on one node, the resources are interleaved between the NUMA nodes, whereas on the other one, NUMA node zero has all instances of device A and all instances of device B are on NUMA node one. And this kind of clearly shows why we were getting the behavior that we were getting. So, the topology manager is responsible for taking care of resource alignment at a node level. However, the scheduler is topology unaware. 
and that is what is leading to suboptimal scheduling decisions. So in order to optimize the scheduling behavior, performance of clusters, and the resource utilization in general, we need to ensure that the scheduler is aware of how those resources are distributed and has the granular information of those resources. And in order to do that, we came up with topology-aware scheduling. This, is, uh, this slide shows the phase one implementation of topology-aware scheduling, which was done as an out-of-free solution. We started back in 2020. Uh, that was alongside Kubernetes 122. So it has, we've come a long way. And in order to do that, we have a few components. So the first one that you see there is the topology-aware scheduler plugin. Kubernetes SIG repo, uh, it houses a bunch of repositories of out-of-free scheduler plugins that are based on scheduling framework. And we contributed node resource topology scheduler plugin to that. And this particular scheduler plugin ensures that we have NUMA-aware scheduler decisions. This scheduler plugin runs a very simplified version of topology manager algorithm, and it helps us determine if a particular node is suitable to run a pod based on, its, based on the resources that it's requesting. In order for the scheduler to have enough information, we have to provide that information. So we do that through node resource API, which often we call it as NRT API, and it is a CRD-based API. And with this API, we are able to decipher between how resources are placed on different NUMA nodes, or it could be different hierarchical structures in general. And the third component is the topology of data agent. In addition to the two components, we need a component that runs on all the nodes, exposes the hardware information, and, and subsequently the scheduler plugin uses that information that is exposed to make the topology aware placement decision. We have two software components that can serve as topology of data agents, NFD and resource topology of, uh, exporter. The diagram on the right that you see, it shows the interaction between different components. We have the control plane, where we have node resource topology API, cube API server, the topology where scheduler plugin, yeah, I should point it. And then we have the worker node where we have the different components. You see the topology of data agents on all the nodes. They are interacting with Kubelet via pod resource API. And then we have the work wor workload that gets uh, placed based on the topology where scheduler. So as part of the phase one, we were able to come up with an end-to-end -end solution with all the different so software components. But there was still a lot to be done. We had to make several optimizations across the stack, as well as in all the different components that we just discussed about. So the first one of them was that um, th this particular slide shows the interaction between the different components. So there could be scenarios that, that some of these operations, being time, time sensitive, can lead to race conditions. So we need to understand how can we overcome those scenarios and have an information where the scheduler has an up-to-date information and, and it's making to the right scheduling decision. So this particular slide gives an example of a race condition between the scheduler and the updater. The blue arrows on the top indicate the pods that are being scheduled over time, and the green arrows at the bottom are indicative of the NRT object updates that happen subsequent to the pod creation. As I said, the accuracy of the scheduler plugin and its decision relies on the fact that you have accurate data as well as fresh data. So the scheduler can end up with stale information, as you see in that, in that corner, because there, there, there could be scenarios where the pod has come up, it has occupied resources, but the resource information has not been updated yet. There are several ways of overcoming this. You can increase the updater interval, or you can have watchable pod resource endpoints, or kubelet endpoints for that matter. But the problem is that the updater is always going to be slower than the scheduler plugin. And, 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 and the main reason for that is that after the pod comes in contact with the API server, scheduler is the, is the next component that serves the pod and processes the pod. So it made sense for us to make changes in the scheduler itself. So we optimized the scheduler 
to take advantage of a local cache with the help of a reserve plugin. So we essentially use the reserve extension point that the scheduler framework provides us. So how did we enable the reserve plugin and uh, implement the local cache? So the first step for us was to keep track of all the resources that, that were allocated but not yet reported back. We call those as unreported resources for the rest of the slides. And this, uh, this cache update happened every time the pod was scheduled on a node. The scheduler doesn't have visibility on what NUMA node the resources are going to be eventually allocated from. That's the responsibility of topology manager. So the scheduler takes a pessimistic approach and deducts those unreported resources from both the NUMA nodes. And the third step is to invalidate the cache. Um, in order to do that, the scheduler looks into, uh, it constantly ensures that after the NRT updates have happened, it has an object called a pod fingerprint that it refers to to determine if the node state corresponds to that of the one that has been updated by NRT updater. So I have a small demo, but I'm going to go through a few slides to explain what I'm going to demo, and then we can we are going to see what the expected behavior is going to be like, and then I'm going to throw, show it through um, the command line. So as you see here, we have um, this particular cluster which was deployed through Minikube, and these are three VMs. The first one being the control plane component, which is running API server topology aware scheduler plugin. The other two are worker nodes running um, kubelet with topology manager configured with single NUMA node policy. Resource wise, we are just looking into CPUs for this particular demo. We have 16 CPUs on each node distributed across two NUMA nodes and a CPU per NUMA node reserved. So that means we have a total of 14 allocatable on each uh, node and we have seven per NUMA node. So just to have a high level information of the, the environment that we are going to be talking about. So what you're going to see in the demo is that we are going to deploy a burst of pods, each requesting six CPUs. And this, this cluster in general is able to accommodate this much resource. But is that what we are going to see? Uh, especially given that we already spoke about over-reservation and the scheduler adopting the pessimistic approach of allocating resources from both the NUMA nodes. So when the first pod comes in, it occupies resources from NUMA node 0 and 1. And this, this particular up, like update that you see is a reflection of the local cache and how it's updated. Once the second pod comes in, again, on the other node, it occupies both the NUMA nodes. Then what happens to the third pod? It essentially, because there's not enough resources left um, in this particular cache, the scheduler keeps it in pending state. But after, after the system has reconciled and the state information that has been updated through NRT updater matches with the, that of the state captured by the scheduler plugin, we see that the pod goes into a running state. So I have a recording here, but I'm going to walk you through a demo. Oops, bad idea. Okay. Okay. So in this demo, as I said, it's deployed with a minikube based cluster. The nodes are under, they are VMs, and we have the Kubernetes cluster deployed with 126 version of Kubernetes. Um, you can see in this, um, in this demonstration that we have three, three nodes on the cluster, one control plane, and two worker nodes. So this is the environment that we're using uh, for demonstrating NumaWare scheduler. They have two NUMA nodes, as, we, as I already explained, we have 14 allocatable per node. So you can see over here um, that this is corresponding to the NUMA nodes. We have seven, NUMA no seven CPUs per NUMA node. And, and this kind of showcases that 
um, the resources are, we have a system that has NUMA nodes and we resources are split across NUMA nodes. Configuration wise, Kubelet has been configured with, with topology manager policy of single NUMA nodes. And if we look at the resource allocation, this is us showing the how NRT API looks like. So we here we are showing here NUMA zero, NUMA one, uh, NUMA one, node zero, node one, and we are showing here allocatable, available, and capacity. Actually, I'd like to show one more thing here. So we have, in addition to um, in addition to all these things, we have something called pod fingerprint, and this had to be enabled for us to do the cache invalidation. So next we are going to see our test workload. And as we already saw, each workload is going to request six CPU and we have three pods here. So these are, um, these, this test group is kind of to simulate that we have a burst of pods and essentially to, to replicate that race condition that I was talking about. Um, we have eight CPUs per NUMA node, which I already explained, and six CPUs are to saturate, you know, the cluster. So once we create the test group, we want to see if the pods were created. So as I explained earlier, we have the two pods go created, but the third pod stays in pending state. So now we have to wait for a little bit for the system to reconcile, and and we are constantly polling to check if uh, if the state has reconciled. And after a little bit, what we see is that the third pod goes into running mode, and the pod gets scheduled. So let's wait for a few more seconds. There we have. So we we see here that the con the test container three of pod three has gone into running state. And now we can look at the resource allocation. Yeah, that's the pod running. And now we look at the resource allocation. And, and that's what we see. So resources have been updated. So that was corresponding to the second node. And we're going to take a quick look at the pods. And we can see here that the, the pod has gone into successfully running state. And prior to that, actually, let's look at this. It was trying to, it was attempting to schedule the pod, and and it was basically showing it wasn't able to schedule the pod. Let me see here. Maybe it's just me failing. Yeah. So this is where you see that, you know, it 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 didn't admit the pods at that stage. And that completes the demo. I'll move back to the slides. So in general, for the phase two developments of the scheduler plugin, we have, uh, we have the reserve plugin implementation and we have the PRs corresponding to that. Uh, we have different caching strategies, which is over reserve, discard, reserved. Uh, for scenarios where, where we are trying to allocate resources from multiple NUMA nodes, because you know there are there are cases where you can't allocate it from a single NUMA node. You might need scenarios that you want to reduce as less as use as less NUMA nodes as possible. So that's the scoring strategy for that. And then we had to make a few changes for uh, for catching up with the changes to the NRT API. Um, so the, as I said, we had to make a few changes to the NRT API, and this was in collaboration with other community members who gave feedback on how there are other case, use cases as well that can use um, NRT API. Uh, NRI plugins is uh, another component that's using this API in addition to topology aware scheduling. So we introduced top level up, uh, attributes for exposing topology policy information. The next step for us is to gather more feedback and uh, move towards V1 beta, v, V1 beta 1. Similar to this, we had to make, this is the third component of topology aware scheduling, uh, the, the node feature discovery. As I said, we have two components, RTE and NFD, and we've been 
we were previously focusing a lot on RTE development as part of Red Hat, and we are currently working really hard to get those these two software components up to speed and a feature parity with each other. So we made a bunch of changes to make sure that NRT it it catches up with NFD, and this, this work is still in progress. Um, like uh, as part of the demo, I showed the pod fingerprinting. Uh, so we, in order to enable the reserve plugin, we had to make changes uh, to the NFT itself. So it has support for pod fingerprinting. So this change corresponds to that. And finally, we have we had to adapt to the V1 Alpha 2 um, changes. And this work is supposed to continue, so watch out for that. And our future plans are scalability testing. We would like to test this uh, solution at scale uh, and evaluate how we can uh, improve the solution and integrate it with dynamic resource allocation as well as VPA. In the long term, we would like to see this solution moving in tree in Kubernetes, and that would naturally have uh, integration with DRA and VPA. Uh, I just want to call out um, all the people who've been involved in this effort. This has been uh, a huge effort that has been spanning multiple years. So all the contributors, reviewers, uh, who've been working tirelessly in, on this. Uh, I want to especially thank Francesco Romani, who's here for uh, creating the demo that I just showed here. So thanks for that. And last but not the least, I just want to mention that we are looking for uh, input from the community members, if there are use cases, if you have thoughts, if you have uh, any any questions, feel free to reach out on the Batch Working Group uh, via Slack or mailing list. We meet every other Thursday uh, at 2 p.m. UTC, so uh, it'd be nice for us for you to join us there. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions if there are. Hello, thank you for the great talk. Quick question again, the pod failure policy. So you mentioned two actions right now, failure and ignoring. Is there any way to like implement custom actions? Uh, no, no. Uh, I, I would ask you to come to uh, open an issue uh, so that we can discuss new additions because it, it has to it has to be implemented in the job controller uh, if I think correctly. But yeah, we can discuss. But uh, it looks we, we, are, right? we are looking for uh, we are looking to implement uh, per index, for example, uh, failures or uh, rules. But uh, that's 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 still being designed. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And can I ask one more question regarding the colorations, which you mentioned that uh, in this scheduler? that what happens if coloration step will fail? How can I handle it? Is there like a specific place where I look for the logs for that? Like pod resources, not the pod, sorry, worker, workloads resources. Oh, I'm not sure I follow the yeah, question. Yeah, there was a step when uh, there's a correlation step, which like uh, resources, colorations. Uh, if you can go to back to, to the slide. To tolerations, you mean? No, no, cor correlations. Oh. No, uh, corollaries? Yeah, probably, yeah. Uh, no, I mean, like, as a corollary, corollary in this context is simply uh, an issue as as a result of the other issues that we are... No, no, there is a step should... when, um, like, you manage to find the proper resources, like, there you, are, you have some predictions, and then you realize you have another, like, resources which are available, right? And there is another step when you update the scheduler. Yeah. Am I right? So no, the way it works is that um, on a regular interval, NRT updater, that the component that we have that, that populates the NRT API, it, it gathers information from a component within Kubelet and populates data. So the scheduler is maintaining its own local cache, and it's, it's keeping track of the resources internally. Uh, because the update that had happened can happen later, you know, uh, from updater standpoint. So it keeps its own cache and makes the scheduling decisions based on that. I, I'm I'm not sure. I. 
So the whole the whole idea of implementing the local cash is to make sure we prevent that failure in the first place. You you, you saw that we could have ended up in a topology affinity error. What we are trying to do is avoid that by actually keeping the pod pending. So we feel that keeping the pod pending is better than it failing because these are important pods that we want, you know, they're, they're for important use cases. So it's better to keep them pending than having them fail. I hope I answer your question. I think we are out of time. I think we are out right, of time. We I can have a chat have after the questions. Thank you very much for today. Yeah, we have a good day.